Our final speaker is Wolf Reich. Thank you, Valerie, and um, thank you for having me, lovely biobank people. Um, and here's 10 minutes on epigenetics. Um, at least I'll, I'll, I will try. So just to introduce ourself, ourselves a little bit. So we have recently moved to, uh, established and moved to a new institute in Cambridge called Altus Labs, Cambridge Institute of Science. Uh, please come and visit us. Many happy people there, happy people in lab coats doing happy experiments <laughs> and hopefully getting happy results. Um, um, so please, please come and visit us. It's a, it's a wonderful new, new venture in, in Cambridge. Um, so the epigenome comes in many different flavors, as I'm sure many of you know. And this ranges from things that are directly attached to the DNA, such as DNA methylation, hydroxymethylation, formal cytosin, carboxycytosin, then histone modifications, um, and then how everything is sort of accessibility and then how everything is sort of wrapped up and established in higher order chromatin, bringing, for example, enhances in contact with promoters for, for, gene, for gene activation. Um, so there are many, of course, um, there's sort of complexity that we face in the epigenome, many different epigenomes, has led to development of many exciting methods to decipher the epigenome, sequence the epigenome using arrays, many different methods that I'm sure many of you are using. And this again for DNA modification ranges from chemical modification of DNA, pull down affinity kind of enrichment methods or restriction enzymes. And this is then you know, put to sequencing or used on, on arrays. Um, that's very popular actually as well. Uh, many, many array studies, and particularly in, in, human, in human population studies. And then for histone modifications, again, you can pull down using antibodies uh, and sequence. There are tagmentation methods now coming on, online, which are very powerful. Chromosome interactions, so how is the, you know, talking about the enhancers and promoters again, how they come into contact to affect uh, gene transcription. All of this can be sequenced by high C, promote a capture high C, more importantly, uh, many exciting methods are coming, coming on stream. Now, even more excitingly, for at least some of us, we can now do many of these things in single cells. And so this ranges from the transcriptome, of course, initially, but also the methylome, histone modifications, DNA modifications, and also high C chromosome organization, all in single cells. But even more interestingly, you can now combine these different omics into multi-omics in single cells. And our most advanced recent method that we develop combines within the same single cell, the transcriptome, RNA sequencing, the methylome by bisulfide sequencing, and chromatin accessibility. Um, this is called NMT-seq, and I can tell you more if you, if you would like to, to know technical details of the method, I can tell you more. And why should we be interested in this, in, in detecting multiomes in single cells? Well, we can decipher regulatory relationships and cell types, lineages, disease situations, we can now begin to pr use predictive gene regulatory networks or develop them, and of course, perturbation screen screens using high throughput uh, CRISPR screening with single cell multiomics. Readouts are, are, are beginning to be immensely powerful as well. Um, so the, the other challenge, of course, once you've developed all these lovely wet lab methods for sequencing the epigenome, multiomics, single cells, everything. So you have to make sense of the, of the data. And this is as great a challenge as developing the wet lab math method. So the, the developing dry lab methods at the same time is, is immensely important. And I, I just give you two examples here uh, from, from recent work from, from our lab and others. One is called multiomics factor analysis. So if you have many different patients, many different assays, 
many different ways of uh, uh, determining data and then features, you can collapse all of this using statistics and machine learning into so-called factors. And a factor might be something that in a particular patient cohort then links a particular modification of an enhancer and a promoter to gene expression, for example, and sort of pops out of this huge flood of data that's in front of you. So it's immensely powerful statistical methods uh, coming on screen. And then also the, the, other, the other thing, of course, which is really, really important, is how, how do we visualize the data? You know, th these are high-dimensional, multi-dimensional data. And how, 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 how can we sort of make sense of it as a, as a human looking at it? In many ways, this is very important. And this is a, just an example of a, a, a network graph where where basically what we're showing here is every dot is a connection between an enhancer and a promoter. And then the dot is colored by histone modifications, other, other epigenome information. This is an embryonic stem cells. And here you can see a repressive network. So this is K27 trimethylation, repressive epigenetic mark. And you can see here Hox genes, this is embryonic stem cells, so before differentiation. Hox genes being majorly repressed, carotenes clusters being ma majorly repressed. These are genes that don't have a function in embryonic stem cells, but they have a function <laughs> later on in development. So at that point in time, they need to be repressed. So th this kind of vis visualization graph-based kind of things are, are really, really important, I think. So why do we care about why, why do we want to study epigenetics? Um, so development, sulfate decisions, and their maintenance is incredibly important. In disease, there are many very key mutations of epigenetic modifiers in cancer and, and, and in developmental disorders, for example. In aging, it's the famous epigenetic aging clock, which I will show you in a moment, and the prospect of rejuvenating cells uh, tissues and organisms, and the many nutritional and environmental influences that can be read out in the epigenome. For example, there's a smoking signature in your epigenome, which is not present in your genome, uh, of course. And then, of course, the great sort of outlook and prospect is that epigenetics is, by definition, reversible. And that's really important. And by drugs and epigenetic editing, and I show you that. Uh, in a moment, and so, um, sorry, confused myself. Um, so, so, how is the epigenome druggable? There, there are two principal ways of thinking about this, basically. One of which is that you take small molecule inhibitors to the epigenetic modifiers themselves, so that's the methylases, histone methylases, acetylases, whatever, this is a very blunt approach, you might say, because it affects so many things in the genome, but quite effective already in, in clinical testing and clinical applications. And then there's a much more targeted approach where you take, um, you know, catalytically inactive Cas9 systems, you fuse them to your favorite epigenetic modifiers, and you target them specifically to particular location in the genome to a particularly important gene um, which is silent, for example, in the disease, and then you reactivate that locus very specifically, very in a very targeted way to, to improve the, the, the disease um, outcome. So to, in closing, just briefly, I want to mention this amazing um, thing, which is the DNA methylation aging clock is the most accurate biomarker of aging that we have in, in humans. It's plus minus 3.6 years is the accuracy. But what's really exciting is not only reads out chronological age, but also biological age. So we might have an epigenetic clock which is slower than our chron chronological age, and then we'll all be sort of happy oldies dancing on the tables, as, as you do. 
or conversely, which is not so nice, is that your epigenetic clock ticks more, more quickly than your chronological clock, and that's associated with many disease, disease um, um, risks. But the, but the really exciting thing is that this is totally reversible. So if you take a human cell, convert it, old human cell, convert it into an IPS, then your age is basically precisely zero, back to being a beautiful baby. Okay, this is really magical. But for many applications, we don't want to go back to IPS and being zero age, but we may have our favorite ages that we want to go back to. <laughs> um, I leave that to your imagination. Um, and sorry for this complicated slide, but we've recently developed a method where we can rejuvenate human cells, maintaining their identity, fibroblasts, but taking 25 or 30 years off the aging clock and restoring functionality um, that's associated with young cells. And this is the complicated version, and this is the um, <laughs> this is the simple version. <laughs> Thank you.